Hello everybody, welcome to the Voice of Faith and welcome to Healing School. So glad you all are here tonight having your Bibles. Let's go please to the book of Romans, the 14th chapter. Romans 14. And let me tell you that this message, I had no idea last week that we were going to give this. The Lord put this in my heart and knowing what we're going to look at, I realized after the Lord gave this to me just like in five minutes uh, this past week, I mean, I just went in my office and sat down and just started writing. Uh, and knowing what we're going to look at, I understand now why the Lord gave this to me. And I believe that healing school would not be complete apart from this message. We are going to get very practical tonight. Very practical. We're going to look at scriptures that we typically do not look at when we deal with the subject of healing and we deal with the subject of faith. So we're going to take our time as we look at these verses and um, we're going to have a great time. Hallelujah. Let me give you the title of the message. For those of you taking notes, the title is this, Personal Faith. Personal Faith. And that will become very obvious to us as we, we go into this tonight. And there is a certain phrase that I'm going to repeat throughout tonight. And that is because I want you to get this. <laughs> I want you to get that particular phrase. It's something we don't often think about. So let's, let's journey into what God has for us this evening. Romans 14, verse number 22, the Word of God tells us this, Hast thou faith? Question mark. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Like I said, we are going to look at verses that we typically don't look at, don't hear a lot about. Let's read that again. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. So that would deal with the conscience and doing those things that our conscience wouldn't condemn us over and not violating our conscience. So here's the phrase that is going to be repeated quite a bit tonight. Faith is very, very personal. And I think that there are times when we teach on faith and a lot of the so-called word of faith and faith circles, we forget that because we deal openly and publicly with the subject of faith. We forget that faith is a very personal thing. It's a personal matter. So, uh, <clears throat> with that, let's, let's launch off again. Let me say that. Let's launch off. Do your best, concerning your own personal faith, do your best to locate your faith. Locate your faith and ask God to show you where you are at. One of the things that really helps us a lot, it helps me in my walk with the Lord, is to locate my faith, to find out where I'm at. Am I strong in a certain area? Am I weak? Is, is there an area where I'm really frustrated and struggling? Or is it something that we would say it's a breeze, it's real easy because my faith is established in that area? Do your best to locate your faith and ask God to show you where you are at. When you find out where your faith is at, do not condemn yourself for where you are not at. And don't get in a pride for where you are at. <laughs> you will probably discover that you're strong in faith in some areas, but then you're weak in faith in another area. So that'll kind of help balance out the whole faith thing. But how many of you know that desiring to be at a certain level does not necessarily mean that you are at that level? You can want it with all your heart. You can have strong desire that you want faith to do you know, fill in the blank, X, Y, Z. But just because you want it and maybe even need it doesn't necessarily mean that your faith is there. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit as well. Locate your faith when you find out where it's at. Don't condemn yourself if you're not where you want to be. And then don't get into pride in those areas that you are at. Because 
you know, in, in all in all honesty, there's no there's no room for pride because Jesus is the author and the developer. He's the perfecter, the finisher of our faith, and without him, we wouldn't have any to begin with. And it's a it's a team effort between us and Jesus. He's helping us to develop our faith, and without him, we wouldn't have any. So those areas that you're strong and robust, we give God praise and thanks for that. Those areas that we're weak in, we, we just look to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, help me to, to get my faith up to a better level, a higher level. Your faith is your business, and it should be very precious to you. Your faith is your business, and it should be very precious to you. Your faith is really nobody else's business. Because once again, it's you and Jesus working on your faith. Now, thank God for spouses and friends that are, that are our faith buddies and can encourage us and help us out. But when, when the door is closed and the, the lights are off, it comes down to you and Jesus and the thoughts and the things that's going on on the inside. So faith is your business. Your faith is your business and really nobody else's. In the book of John, chapter 5, there is a statement that Jesus makes that I have thought about a lot recently over the last two or three weeks. This verse keeps coming back to my mind and the Lord wanted me to put this in with this message. Another verse that we normally don't look at, John 5, 44. We normally don't look at this verse in dealing with faith. This is a really strong word from the Master. John 5, 44. Glad you brought your Bibles. I'll wait till you get there. Let you see the word for yourself and give the Holy Spirit opportunity to speak it to you, to minister it to you. So important to read the word for yourself. John 5, verse 44, Jesus makes this statement. He says, it's a question, how can ye believe, <coughs> excuse me, how can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? So obviously there is an honor that comes from our Heavenly Father and it only comes from Him. Once again, faith is very personal. This is an important question that we need to answer and it shows us why people's faith is hindered. You are never going to get healed or a miracle. You, pardon me. You are never, <laughs> you are never to get healed or, or a miracle to prove to others that you have faith. You are never to get healed or a miracle to prove to others that you have faith. To try and impress people with your faith it's wrong. <laughs> it, it's pride. And so in, in the life of faith and looking for faith for healing, we need, to, we need to check our heart. What's my motive in this? And that's true with healing, but that's true with everything else in our walk with the Lord is we're, we're believing God for things. Why am I believing this? Am I wanting so-and-so to think good of me, to think well of me? Well, that's, that's not going to work. That will hinder us uh, and, and if not hinder us, uh, possibly just totally right out, stop us from receiving what we're, what we're wanting from the Lord. Also in this, not, not only are we to not uh, look to people in the sense that for them to give us a pat on the back and think, wow, you know, Brother Rick, is he, well, he's just a mighty man of faith. He's real spiritual. Not only can we not do that, here's something else that we, we cannot afford to do. Well, I'm going to show them this works. I'm going to prove to them. 
that this faith stuff works. I'm going to get healed. I'm going to get my needs met. And I'm going to prove to my sister. I'm going to prove to my family once and for all that what I believe is right and what they believe is wrong. We're not called to prove that the Word of God is true. We're not called to prove that tongues is for today or healings for today or prosperity is the will of God. We're not called to prove any of that. We are called to live by faith and walk with the Lord. We're to let God take care of what people think. So we're not, we're not out to make people think well of us, nor are we out to, well, I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you that this faith stuff works. That will hinder your faith. That will hinder you greatly from receiving your healing. Hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> I have my notes, but I'm, I'm waiting on the Holy Spirit too. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. We forget, and I know that I forget, and maybe I shouldn't say we, I'll speak of myself. I forget and I have to remind myself and I have to have the Holy Spirit bring it to my remembrance. Something so simple and yet when the Holy Spirit brings it to my remembrance, it keeps my heart pure and my motive right, keeps me in line. Healing is holy. Healing is holy. Miracles are holy. Answer to prayer is holy. Every time God has healed you, it is a holy moment. It has been a holy moment. Healing is holy. And when I tend to forget that, because we get caught up in it to teaching and this, and you experience it, and others experience it, it can become routine. And we are to expect, and we are to walk in it, but we can lose that sense of reverence, that sense of respect. And we need to say, okay, what just happened? This is holy. Man didn't do this. Man couldn't do this. This was something that Jesus did in our midst. This is holy. This is uh, <clears throat> something that, that God really dropped into my heart and gave me this word for word for this message and has talked to me about this. He said, stop thinking about what people are going to say, think, or how they are going to react to your healing. Stop thinking. Stop thinking about what people are going to say, think, or how they are going to react to your healing. I'm going to say that again. People are taking notes. Stop thinking about what people are going to say, think, or how they are going to react to your healing. And you're going to find your mind going there. And you have to go, nope, I'm not thinking that. I'm casting that down. It's not important what people think. It's not important what they're going to say or how they're going to react or respond. That's none of my business, none of my concern. Stop thinking about what people are going to say, think, or how they are going to react to your healing. It will stop you or at least hinder you from receiving. Your healing is between you and Jesus. Your healing is between you and Jesus. I'm going to say it again. Faith is very personal. Sometimes when we get to thinking about what people are going to say and do and how they're going to react or respond, sometimes we can go there and it can be like a good thing that we think that it's going to be positive and they're going to do this and they're going to call this person and it's going to spread and this and that and People are going to come over and people are going to say, how would you get your healing? We may have some good intention with that, but once again, we can get pulled off. 
And I'm convinced that when healings and miracles and things happen, we might be surprised at what response is given and by whom. So it's really not our business. It's, your healing is strictly between you and the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. It's no, <laughs> all right, here we go. It is nobody's business. If you take medicine, go to the doctor, or get an operation. <laughs> Faith is very personal. It is nobody's business. If you take medicine, go to the doctors, or get an operation. That is between you and your Lord Jesus. One more time. Faith is very personal. It is nobody's business. If you take medicine, go to the doctor, or get an operation. That is between you and the Lord Jesus. So since it isn't their business, don't let it become their business. Don't worry about what they're going to think. Don't worry about what they're going to say. Your faith is between you and the Lord, and it's personal. They didn't have stripes put on their back. They didn't go to Calvary for you. So they have no say in the matter. Glory to God. I should have had you hold your place in Romans. I apologize. I think I did that last week too, didn't I? <laughs> Romans 14. Romans 14. 10 through 13. Another passage we'll look at. Romans 14, 10 through 13. Are you getting it that faith is personal? Yep. Yeah, yep. glory to God. We're going to meddle with this just a little bit more. We're going to look at some areas, along with medicine and doctors and all that good stuff. Romans 14, 10 through 13, the Word of God tells us this. But why dost thou judge thy brother... Or why dost thou set it not, thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. That really is a liberating scripture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Remember Jesus being raised from the dead and he's sitting around talking to Peter? Peter says, what about John? I love the Lord's answer. He says, he says what is that to you? <laughs> you follow me. You, you do what I tell you to do and you don't worry about John, right? We get too caught up in the, what everybody else is doing. I love this verse. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. That's enough. I don't need you. I don't need to give an account for you. i got to give an account for me. That's a full-time job. Glory to God. Verse 13, let us, uh, yeah, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. In the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 2, I think it is. Yes, it is. It is Colossians chapter 2, 16 and 17. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. These are some kind, some kind of free inscriptors right here. We are not to judge others. We're not to judge others concerning their faith their faith walk where they're at it's dangerous to do so because in reality we don't know the amount of light or the amount of revelation that that person has in their heart you know somebody can can quote something or or be a parrot and repeat something but in in reality we don't know what type what amount of light that person has and if we are spending time with them and we're, we're, we have a certain amount of light and we're walking in that light and we have a close friend, we assume that they have the same light we do. 
And so when something happens and we look at him and we go, well, what's wrong with you? Where is your faith? What happened to you? And that's, that's dangerous. We don't know the light that they have. I had, uh, and I've, I've shared in healing school that I'm going to share with you my personal experiences and I've shared a lot of different things about healings and things that have happened in my life and ministry. But by the same token, I need to be honest with you and share with you some of the areas that I've failed in. Right? I can't just give you all the positive. I've got to let you know about the times I've failed as well. So we can get some insight from that. When I was pastoring in Illinois, just I guess two or three years into it, my eyesight started going bad very, very quickly. And so I went to the doctor and he said, you have a rare form of cataract in both eyes. And you will be blind not in a matter of months, but in a matter of weeks. This is very fast acting. He said, I'm sure you can tell like within 48 hours just how, how quickly it's progressing. I'm going, yes, that's why I'm here. You know, what's going on? So he said, you have this very rare form. It's very fast acting. If you don't have surgery, you're going to be blind. Hmm. So here I am preaching healing and the word of faith. And so now I'm faced with surgery. I've got to have an operation. I hadn't had an operation since I was eight, nine years old and had my right hand operated on. So it's like, okay, I can take you to the spot on uh, Route 157 in Edwardsville, Illinois. I'm praying. And I said, Lord, I really want my eyes to be healed. And so clearly, the Lord Jesus spoke back to me. And he said to me, according to your faith, so be it unto you. I pulled over to the side of the road and began to cry. Because I knew that I didn't have the faith. And he knew that I knew. And I knew that he knew that I knew. It just wasn't there. And I put my head over the stream wheel and wept and wept and wept. Because I want to live what I teach and preach. And I want to be an example to my congregation. According to your faith, so be it unto you. And I knew. I knew that it just wasn't there. So once again, you can desire to have your faith at a certain level, but desiring it and it being there is two different things. So I went home, told my family, this is the way it is, I'm going to have surgery. So I had surgery, they removed the cataracts from both eyes, not at the same time, I had two separate surgeries. And during that period of time, I had a, a head deacon in the church and during the service he would stand and he would read my, my text and I would preach and teach because I couldn't see. I judged myself, and I condemned myself for where I was not at. But in addition to that, my church judged me. And for a while, people just kind of backed away and stood aloof from Pastor Philip E. Flynn. And I felt their judgment. I felt their condemnation. Well, um, where's it at, faith preacher? You're our pastor. You teach on this stuff. Where is it at? How come you had to have surgery? How come you had to have surgery? No one asked. But you could tell. <laughs> oh, you could tell. I could tell real, real well. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. The Bible says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. Not only are we not to condemn ourselves, and not only are we to not judge others, we're to not allow others to judge us. Well, how's that? How do you stop somebody from judging you? You don't receive it. You come to the place where you realize that their judgment is invalid. Amen. Mm -hmm. We only have one judge. And that's, I'm thankful for that. I only have one judge. And he will get it right. 
He knows my heart. He knows the amount of light I have. And when I stand before him on that day, it will be a just judgment. I like what Brother Hagin used to say. He said, I've been judged by experts and little spurts. And I think I've, I can relate to that. I've been judged by experts and little spurts. I've been judged by a lot of people. And everybody gets it wrong because they don't know what's on the inside. Let no man therefore judge you. And he gives some specific things about meat, drink, respect of holy day, new moon, or, or Sabbath days. Then he says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. We're going to understand that here in a moment. Romans 10. Romans 10, 17. Faith is very personal. Your faith is between you and the Lord. And where you're at is nobody's business. If you have to take medicine, if you have to have a cane or a crutch or glasses or whatever, it's nobody's business. Hallelujah. This is supposed to be a freeing message. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Where the Bible is silent, we are to be silent. What the Bible briefly mentions, we are to briefly mention. What the Bible does speak about, we are to major on. I'm going to give that to you again. Where the Bible, where the Bible is silent, we are to be silent. What the Bible briefly mentions, we briefly mention. What the Bible does speak about, we are to major on. The Bible is a book that deals with our redemption. It is a book about our covenant with God. There are many things the Bible does not tell us. There are many everyday scenarios the Bible does not teach us. And for good reason. Think how big the Bible is now. <laughs> it could be twice as big or three times as big if God gave us other things. But it is a book about our redemption. In 1 Timothy 4, please read this one with me. 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. This will be a major section for tonight. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. <clears throat> when, in this statement that what the Bible is silent about, we're silent. What the Bible briefly mentions, we briefly mention. I, I say it like this, that we, we are not to major on the minors, and so many people minor on the majors. What the Bible emphasizes, we are to emphasize. We are to major on the majors. There are some things in the Word that are minor. Those are to be minor for us. But the things that the Bible emphasizes, those things that are of major importance, those are the things that we should be spending our time with. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Once again, please notice these words very carefully. Now the Spirit, that's a capital S, that's the Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. I love that phrase. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter times, are we there? Yes. <laughs> Nobody's ever lived in a later time than us, right? So the Holy Spirit is speaking directly to you and I. I believe we're the last generation before the coming of the Lord. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. What will they do? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Please notice that term seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, 
speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Then he gives us some of those doctrines of devils. Forbidding to marry. You know of any type of church that forbids their ministers to marry. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Amen. The Bible does not, does not teach nutrition and exercise. The Bible does not teach nutrition and exercise. Where the Bible is silent, we are to be silent. Vegetarian does not equal spiritual. <laughs> Here's what's happened. We, are, we have found ourselves in the latter days in the exact same scenario that Jesus found when he was here. Jesus came and there was the scribes, the Pharisees, and the doctors of the law, and they had added so much stuff to what God had originally given them. And Jesus said, your traditions, the traditions of men, have made the word of God of no effect. And in our day, we have the same thing. There is so much stuff being added on to the gospel that it's causing the word of God to be of none effect. And we're taking those things that are minor, are not mentioned, and we're putting them up and attaching them to the gospel. Vegetarian does not equal spiritual. This is a doctrine of devils. No one was more spiritual than Jesus, and he ate meat. I had someone tell me, I don't eat meat. Really? Yep, I'm a vegetarian. Well, okay, well, how come? I'm being spiritual. I want to be as spiritual as I can be. Hmm. Pop the balloon. Well, would you agree with me that Jesus was spiritual? Oh, yeah, he was. I said, probably the most spiritual person, right? Oh, yeah. Well, the Bible says he ate meat. What? You'll never get any more spiritual than Jesus, and he ate meat, and he ate honey, and if you leave honey out long enough, it turns into sugar. So if you're looking to be spiritual, abstaining from all meats and becoming a vegetarian is not what's going to bring you being spiritual, nor will it necessarily make you healthy. Oh, Brother Phil, but what about Genesis 1? Well, let's go to Genesis 1. Brother Phil, I got a scripture that says I'm to be a vegetarian. Okay? Genesis 1.29. I had someone tell me that, that this was their scripture that they used to be a vegetarian. That it was God's will for all of us to be a vegetarian. And this was their proof text. Genesis 1.29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. See, Phil, that's our meat. Our meat is, is all this the, from the trees, the fruits, the vegetables. We're not to have any meat whatsoever. I said, okay, so uh, that's it, huh? Yep, that's it. Well, you cannot base being a vegetarian on this verse. Once again, Jesus ate meat. And also, if God did not want you to eat meat, then how come when he created you, he gave you the type of teeth he gave you? Our teeth is what is known as canine teeth, and it's for ripping, cutting, and tearing of meat. So creation itself, the way God created you, he gave you teeth to eat meat. If he wanted you to be a vegetarian, he would have given you a different type of set of teeth, and we would not have been able to eat meat. Hallelujah. I know this is different. <clears throat> we are not to use the pulpit to teach nutrition, diet, and exercise. 
We are not to use the pulpit to teach nutrition, diet, and exercise. If you're into nutrition, that's fine. I know that medically, scientifically, that people have changed their diet and they've been healed of cancer and all kinds of physical problems have left. I don't deny that. And if you, if you want to do that, that's fine. But the pulpit is not the place to teach and preach nutrition, diet, and exercise. We're adding to the word what is not there. And it is sending a wrong signal to those seeking healing. There are many Christians that are sick and they're looking for answers. And so they go to church and the minister stands up and he's going to teach on healing and he gets over and talking about vitamins and water and an exercise routine and their faith begins to go from by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed and from all of the words that we've looked at in healing school and now my faith is in an exercise regimen. And we're making the word of God of no effect. I'm not saying don't exercise. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying, you know, stop taking your vitamins. I'm saying it's not a part of the gospel and doesn't belong in the pulpit. Also, in the Word of God, in, in the pulpit area, I have noticed this more and more. And I, there's two brothers in this town that I love. They're pastors. I love them. appreciate them. But the pulpit is not the time to be funny. I know two ministers that every time they're up, they're always trying to crack jokes. All throughout their message, they're trying to get their congregation to laugh. And I know God uses humor. I understand that. But it should be natural and unforced. And just because you have a funny thought while you're ministering doesn't mean it should be shared. This is not comedy central. This is not the comedy hour. It is time to impart truth and grace into people's lives. There's, I just think there's too much lightness and looseness and we are losing respect for the ministry and it's because of things like these. And we're not majoring on the things that God in His Word has emphasized to us. When I was pastoring, I had a situation that was very unpleasant happen to me and I'd like for you to read with me in Philippians 4 as I share this with you. While I was pastoring, there were some people that came to my church and they begin to preach on a certain vitamin that they had, a certain product, and certain water. And so they were in my church for a while. And they put a lot of pressure on me and on my people to buy their product. Now these were Christian people. They, as far as I can remember, they spoke in tongues or filled with the Spirit. But they stood around, stayed with, at the church for a couple months. I lost two families over this. I lost two families because I would not get on their bandwagon and promote their product and preach on vitamins and water and all the stuff that they wanted to do. And they made us feel so condemned, so guilty, because this is it, this is the answer, you've got to go with this, and I, you're not going to be a good pastor if you don't teach this stuff. I needed a word from God because I was losing some family members and the church was upset. And I, was, I said, Lord, I need a word from you. I need a word, and I need a good, strong word about this subject. And God gave me a word. And I not, not only appreciate what he said to me, but I appreciate the way he said it to me because it, it took off all the pressure and all the junk that I was under to conform to these people that had come into my congregation. And it set me free. And here's what the Lord said to me. He said, Son... It is not what you eat, but how much you eat. It is not what you eat, but how much you eat. Philippians 4, 5 says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. My wife and I like fried foods. We eat fried foods mm, three times a year. Mm, probably a little more than that. Okay, not much more. We like pork chops. We eat them two, three times a year. Maybe. Maybe. Not much. 
you cannot convince me that that is going to affect my health. It's not what you eat. <coughs> it's how much you eat. See, here's the thing. The Holy Spirit knows your body better than anyone else. We are to follow His leading in matters of diet and exercise. This is one of those areas that the Bible does not talk about because you are to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit for yourself. The Holy Spirit knows what's good for you, what you're to eat, what you're not to eat, what you need to back off from, what you can eat more of. If you need to get out and exercise, that is your faith. That is between you and the Lord and the Holy Spirit directing you. You're not to let anybody judge you concerning your diet. Nutrition is not the main thing. It's not even a by thing. We'll do a lot better if we will follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and not let anybody put us under guilt and condemnation and say, you have to eat this, you can't eat that, you've got to drink this, you've got to walk three miles a day. That's not the gospel. And once again, when that's taught, people's faith for healing gravitates toward what... See, it's this. It's what I'm doing as opposed to what Jesus has done. There's a scripture that's gnawing at me, and I apologize that I haven't taken time and i got to get back in it. But the disciples asked Jesus, how can we do great works? How can we do miracles? And forgive me for paraphrasing, but the Lord said, this is the work of God, that you believe on me. And I'm beginning to see as that scripture is gnawing at me, that when we add on all this stuff, it takes our focus off of Jesus and what he has accomplished for us, and now it's based on my performance. Your healing is not based on your performance, it's based on what he's done for you. Now, if the Holy Spirit leads you to do something, you do it. But your faith should be in the stripes of Jesus and in his word, not in a set of vitamins. Hallelujah. I want to deal with one other thing tonight before we close. This is practical, but it also deals with more of a, a spiritual aspect of healing. I want us to read one of my favorite stories that we've read so much in healing school. And I want us to look at, at J. Iris and his daughter in Mark chapter 5. Let's revisit J. Iris for a moment. Him and his situation. Faith is very, very personal. Mark 5. Hallelujah. Mark 5. And we will pick up the story in verse number 22. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, fell at his feet. Verse 23, please notice, and besought him greatly, saying, look very carefully at Jairus' words. This is what he said to Jesus. My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. So just remember, look at those words, look what he said. Verse 24, And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And we pick up Jairus' story, because the woman with issue of blood came in. Verse 34, uh, verse, I'm sorry, verse, verse 35, While he yet spake, he was dealing with the, with the woman with the issue of blood, he says, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Jairus said, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come, lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. 
verse 35, they said, Don't bother the master. Thy daughter is dead. Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Look at what Jesus said. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. J Jairus, when he went to Jesus, he spoke certain things to him. And in doing so, he had what I call the voice of faith. There was something in his words that Jesus stopped what he was doing, turned right around, and began to follow this man to his home to heal his daughter. Now, so Jesus is going with Jairus, and then they come and they say to him, your daughter is dead. This is not the bearer of bad news. This is worst case scenario. This is not, well, she's worse, her temperature's gone up a few degrees. This is the ultimate. This is not a bad report. This is an evil report. This is, it's over with. Don't bother Jesus, your daughter is dead. Jesus says to him, don't be afraid, only believe. Now, I want you to notice what Jairus said. Look what he said. Verse 36, As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, say Peter and James and John. The... Jairus didn't say anything. Jairus didn't say anything. What did Jairus say after he got the report of his daughter being dead? Nothing. Nothing. I want you to get this truth. You need to know when to confess your healing and when not to. You need to know when to confess your healing and when not to. There is a right time to confess I'm healed there is a wrong time to confess that I am healed. There is a right time to, to proclaim your faith. There is a time to not say anything at all. Let's hook up this story with Jesus' teaching in Matthew 7. In Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Let's look at Jesus' teaching in connection with the story of Jairus. And this really opens this up to us in a profound way. There is a time to confess you're healed. There is a time not to confess you're healed. In Matthew 7, 24, Jesus is teaching and he says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I don't know if I've shared this with you or not, but I'm convinced as I've gone over this that these two men were neighbors. These guys lived on the same block. They were neighbors. Because the description of the storm to the man who built his house on the rock is the exact same description of the storm of the man who built his house upon the sand. Okay? J. Iris said nothing after he got the report about his daughter being dead. We need to know when to confess we're healed and when not to. Matthew 7 is very illuminating because it comes down to this. Sunny days you build, stormy days you rest. The sunny days of your life when nothing's going on, there's no pressure, there's no trials, during the sunny days, you build your life. You build faith. You speak the word. You speak healing. You speak victory. You speak prosperity. During the stormy days, you don't say anything at all. You rest. The devil will bring you a bad report. 
you don't need to say anything because you already said it. <laughs> when and, and this is where you got to learn to be led by the Spirit and know what's in your heart. Know where you're at. But if the dark clouds are coming in and there's a torrent of rain and all, what well, we say, all hell's broken loose, you just, you just learn the vocabulary of silence. You just go, you don't say anything. You just shut down. Because you've already spoken the word of faith during the sunny days. Jairus spoke words of faith when he said, if you'll come lay your hands on my daughter, she'll be healed. When he got the, the, the report about his daughter being dead, don't you know as a father all the emotions? The, the Bible tells us that he had only one daughter. She was about 12 years of age. This is his only daughter, his only child. This is his little girl. All of the emotion, all of the thoughts, the feelings, the this stuff's not working, it's too late. All of that junk. And Jesus said, be not afraid, only believe. And Jairus just wouldn't say anything. Jairus knew the vocabulary of silence. He knew when to confess and he knew when to be quiet. I have discovered that there are times when I'm under pressure that it's wrong for me to begin to confess the word because I'll start on the word but I'll wind up confessing the junk. I'll confess the problem, I'll confess the storm, and oh my God, it's bad, it's bad, it's really bad now. Because all that emotion is working in me. And so I, you just got to learn to shut down. Many times when that stuff is coming your way and you get the bad report or an evil report, if you're able to speak words of, of you know, the Bible words only, sometimes, depending on how bad it is, you may be quoting the Bible, but it's, it's no longer faith, it's fear. It's desperation. So it's best just to not say anything at all. You build during the sunny days, and you rest during the stormy days. As we close, we're going to put two verses together. Ephesians 6 and James 3. Ephesians 6 is where we'll read first. Ephesians 6.16 6, and James 3.6. Ephesians 6.16 6, and James 3.6. Let's put these two verses together. This is what Jairus was experiencing. This is what you and I experience in this life. Ephesians 6.16 6, and James 3.6. I don't know if you guys have ever put these two verses together, but this is wonderful. Faith is very, very personal. You need to know when to speak and when not to. Here's another way of looking at that when the storms of life are, are hitting you and things are seeming to fall apart. Ephesians 6.16 Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. What type of darts? Fiery. They're not just darts, they're fiery darts. Okay, look at that, please. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all, thank God it says all, the fiery darts of the wicked. James 3, verse 6. Let's read verse 5 and 6. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire is kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, the world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. When you are under pressure to say something you shouldn't say, that pressure is a fiery dart aimed at your mouth. When the storms hit and there's pressure, and boy, you want to say something and it would feel so good to say it. Oh man, there was a situation this week I wanted to cuss so bad. 
And I didn't want to cuss a little bit. I wanted to cuss a lot with a lot of words, a lot of big words, man. The pressure was on for me to cuss. Did you? Of course not. <laughs> I thought of these two verses. That pressure to say something you shouldn't say is the devil shooting a fiery dart at your mouth. The devil wants to set on fire the course of your life. I wanted to damn the thing, and the thing didn't need to be damned. It needed to be blessed. <laughs> and the devil is putting pressure to say something, for me to say something. That fiery dart in your mouth, when you begin to say what you shouldn't say, it sets the course. It's like, it's like a, taking some gasoline, and you got a little trail, and then you light at one end, and that whole, whole line it ignites and catches on fire. The course, the devil has a course for your life. And so he puts a fiery dart, aims it at your mouth, puts pressure on you. And if you yield to that, it sets on fire the course of life, the course of nature. And you're going to go in a direction you don't want to go in. That's what the devil was doing to Jairus. Your daughter's dead. Don't bother the master. Jesus said to him, don't be afraid, only believe. If Jairus had said, oh Jesus, my daughter is dead, she's dead, she's dead. <laughs> that course would have been set. And Jesus would have had a hard time going and raising her, his girl up from the dead. He was going because of the man's faith. And when he said to him, be not afraid, only believe. He's thinking, okay. I got all this emotion, but I've already spoken my faith, so I'm just going to be quiet. And Jesus was able to take his words of faith and raise his daughter from the dead. Faith is very, very personal. Don't let anybody judge you concerning diet, exercise, vitamins, and don't let anybody judge you about medicine, doctors, operations, and don't let anybody judge you concerning the confession of your faith when you say it and when you don't because your faith is very, very personal. You will speak words of faith as your spirit and as the Holy Spirit prompts you, but when there's pressure, be quiet. Don't say anything. And let the angels and the Master go to work over the words you've already said. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Amen. It's, it's a personal faith. Thank you for watching The Voice of Faith. We appreciate it. Until next time, remember what Jesus said to Jairus. We say to you every time we get together around the good Word of God, be not afraid, only believe.